everyone, and welcome to the very last podcast in humanities and Western civilization. You finally reached the end. After 10,000 years of human history, we have arrived at Unit 12, the interwar period to World War II. We're going to be covering what uh, Europe was like after uh, World War I, um, the Great Depression, the rise of the Soviet Union, and then we're going to talk about the rise of fascism and World War II and its immediate aftermath, the Cold War. The learning outcomes for this unit are, number one, describe the post-war society. This is the society that emerged after World War I. Number two, outline the Great Depression. Number three, describe the new political movements, communism, and fascism. Number four, understand the basic narrative of World War II. And finally, assess the beginnings of the Cold War. So Germany following World War I was a completely different place. Um, the Germany that had emerged in the late 19th century was the German Empire. And as we had learned in the last podcast, it was a militaristic and autocratic state uh, led by the Kaiser. However, after the war, the Allied uh, countries reformed Germany as a democratic republic. Um, the capital of Germany was moved uh, to Weimar. Um, and the new republic became known as the Weimar Republic. That's the name given to the democratic government, which replaced the imperial government in 1919. Um, suffice to say that Germany after the war was not in a great place. The war reparations, that is the payments that Germany had to pay the um, victors, were ravaging the German economy. Um, we saw hyperinflation during the 1920s. You know, for example, um, there you see a, a picture of a, um, a thousand mark note. And because a thousand mark was essentially worthless, it has been overstamped uh, to be a one million mark note. Um, it, banks and government had to do this because they just couldn't print money fast enough. Money was um, the was becoming more and more value uh, valueless um, in a hyperinflation environment, and the economy was in shambles. Um, in 1924, the United States led a movement to try to stabilize the German economy. It became known as the Dawes Plan, named after the vice president of the United States that spearheaded the movement um, to see it happen. In. And essentially what the Dawes Plan did is it tried to mitigate some of the worst effects of the Treaty of Versailles. Um, it um, allowed for uh, Germany to have foreign troops withdrawn from uh, the Ruhr Valley. And it also uh, had the United States lend Germany quite a bit of money so that Germany could make its reparation payments to Britain and France. Um, this, of course, was going to have profound um, uh, impact uh, once we get to the Great Depression, as we'll see in a moment. So while things were going really badly in Germany, elsewhere, uh, things actually started to really turn up in the 1920s. Um, the 1920s are sometimes referred to as the Roaring Twenties because the economy rebounded in many Western countries by the mid part of the decade and things actually really greatly improved. It's during this time period that historians and social scientists would identify the beginnings of something that we call mass society. So what is mass society? A society in which traditional social ties and divisions have weakened in favor of broad homogeneity, that is, similarity. But what do we mean by that? Mass society comes with it, this massive growth in consumption and advertising. It also goes comes along with um, this, this increase in media production. And so we have like Hollywood churning out movies, we have radios, and all of this is creating this sort of shared global culture. Um, mass consumption and mass society means that people around the world are buying the same things. They're consuming the same cultural cues around the world. It's not to say that there aren't local differences, but it does mean that we're beginning now to share in a collective society, a mass society now. And it's something, of course, that we still live in today. When you think about, say, pop music or movies, I mean, these are things that we share nearly around the entire planet. And this really only begins for the first time in the 1920s. 
It's also during this time that we see the democratization of leisure. Previous to the 20th century, things like going on vacation or taking a holiday were something only that the ultra wealthy could do. But once we reach the 1920s, the economy is such that um, we start to see middle class people uh, doing things like taking a holiday. Part of this is um, a result of the betterment of the economy, but part of it is also just a cultural shift as well, too. We see people using their cars to pile them up with, you know, their suitcases and drive out to the beach and, and take a, a family holiday. Um, it's also the result of changing labor laws that allow things like holidays. Um, and all of this is happening in the so-called Roaring 1920s. In the Roaring 1920s, we start to see a lot of cultural changes. For instance, uh, we see a relaxation of expressions of sexuality and dress. Um, we see the spread of African-American culture, particularly jazz music coming out of America. There you see a poster for Josephine Baker, who is one of the most famous jazz singers of the 1920s, an African-American woman. Um, we also see, um, uh, for women in general, a uh, flapper fashion and style, which you see um, actress Louise Brooks there uh, dressed in the typical fashion of the day, flapper fashion. And this is really a reaction against the really strict um, Victorian ideal of women, which had them covered completely with clothing. Uh, even their ankles really couldn't uh, be shown. Uh, so the Roaring Twenties are really represent a massive relaxation in the um, the way we dress and in the expression of sexuality. Partially as a result of the social changes coming out of World War I, we also, in the 1920s, see a major step forward in the rights of women. Uh, women's suffrage is achieved in many Western countries. Suffrage means the right to vote. So we had seen in the 1800s universal male suffrage achieved. That is, all men, generally speaking, had the right to vote in elections. But now we start to see countries allow women to vote. So we see women's suffrage finally achieved in the United States in 1920. Germany 1919, Britain 1918, um, Canada in 1917, one of the first countries which we can uh, be proud of. Um, other countries were a lot slower. France was not until 1944 that women were allowed to vote. In Italy, it wasn't until after the war in 1946. But clearly the trending direction is women uh, being given greater rights in society. But the good times eventually had to come to an end. By the end of the 1920s, we entered into the Great Depression. The Great Depression was a severe economic crisis which lasted more than a decade. Although it began in the US, the, due to the interconnectedness of the global economy, it quickly spread worldwide. Um, normally, um, people point to the beginning of the Great Depression being uh, the stock market crash in 1929. Um, however, we know that the stock market crash did not cause the Great Depression. Rather, it's an early symptom of the Great Depression, um, regardless um, uh, of, of its causes. And we'll go through those in just a moment. The Great Depression caused massive suffering around the world. Um, industry essentially ceased in many, many countries, and the unemployment rate skyrocketed around the world. Uh, with so many people out of work, it also caused a lot of uh, social strife as well. Here you see an image of unemployed men in Toronto uh, marching, uh, trying to get jobs. In 1933, for example, the unemployment rate in Canada hit 20%, which is absolutely massive. So the Great Depression in the 1930s had several major causes. Um, the first of it is something that we've already discussed a little bit, which is war debt. So um, all countries involved in World War I had spent heavily and had gotten themselves deeply into debt following World War I. And then on top of that, the victors, Britain and France, had forced Germany uh, to pay massive reparations payments, which Germany couldn't afford to pay. Um, and part of the reason why Germany and France uh, needed money from, Germ uh, from Germany is because they owed lots of money themselves. And who did they owe money to? They owed money to the United States. That was where they had mostly borrowed money during the war. So under the Dawes plan, the United States lent money to Germany so that Germany could pay its war reparation payments to Britain and France, who in turn could pay that money back to the United States. As you can see, 
this creates simply a circle of debt or a house of cards which makes no sense and was just uh, liable to collapse at any moment another symptom of the great depression that we see um, is easy credit and a lot of speculation on the stock market so speculation is where people are investing not because they think that a company for example is a good company and has good prospects but because they just think that its stock is going to rise and this can create um, a very volatile stock market we also had a lot of people participating in the stock market using debt to do so so people would borrow money from the bank in order to buy stocks in the stock market and the banks were actually doing this too they were borrowing money and then from each other and simply reinvesting it in the stock market this meant that when the stock market actually crashed everyone was losing a massive amount of money and in addition finding themselves deeply in debt we also see in the towards the end of the 1920s uh, that we've reached the limit of what at that point in time the economy could consume uh, basically everyone who had bought a radio had already bought a radio and there just wasn't the market to continue to produce um, uh, products at the same rate that we were producing them before so during the roaring 1920s we see factories churning out all sorts of things and eventually there's just not enough people buying them so we have a symptom of overproduction and under consumption and the final um, problem is that towards the end of the 1920s we see a decline in the price of grain um, and this was a problem because um, more and more people had gotten involved in grain farming during the 1920s partially because during the war there was a shortage of grain and everyone was keen to buy more food they had to feed all of those soldiers and so more and more uh, farmers were putting uh, land under the plow and um, and, um, and and producing more grain the more grain that we dumped onto the market in return um, pushed down the price of grain and so this created this sort of self-fulfilling prophecy uh, that um, if you're the price of grain is falling well then you're probably going to try to grow more grain to make up your losses more grain gets dumped onto the market and the price gets depressed even further all of this leads up to the late 1920s when the Great Depression starts generally speaking the way world governments reacted to the Great Depression made it worse uh, they never encountered anything like this before they acted according to a classical economic theory and those theories basically intensified the crisis under classical economic theory um, if uh, tax revenue is falling which of course it did during the Great Depression then governments should in turn spend less um, but as government activity um, decreases so does uh, the ability for people to get work and to pay taxes and so it creates sort of a self-fulfilling prophecy this is what you would normally do on a personal level like if you lost your job you would cut back um, but in the Great Depression governments cutting back spending turned out to be the worst possible thing that they could do um, we also see a spike in interest rates uh, everywhere so nobody wants to lend anyone else any money because no one believes that they can pay it back and so if they are going to lend money then they're going to do it at a huge interest rate so this essentially again diminishes economic activity and makes it worse to top it all off everybody all the countries that is started to be very protective over trade they started to enact tariffs so that their local domestic industries would be protected but that also meant that other people were enacting tariffs so if Canada enacts a tariff the United States enacts a tariff and they end up not being able to sell to each other again this diminishes economic activity now there were some people that were calling for a new approach one person is the British economist John Maynard Keynes um, the as it became known the Keynesian alternative uh, would be eventually the path that most governments would start to take and generally speaking this is now the way most governments react to recessions um, and that is that governments should spend money governments should do the opposite of what they did during the Great Depression that they should in fact in the absence of a functioning economy if everyone else is afraid to spend then the government has to 
So the Keynesian approach can be seen in uh, what the United States did uh, beginning in 1933, which was called the New Deal. And this was a series of domestic programs, um, basically building roads and, and government buildings and infrastructure, um, uh, where they just simply hired as many people as they possibly put, just put as many American men to work. Uh, between 1933 and 1938 the idea is is that the government will hire people if nobody else will and then these people will take their earnings and some of that money is going to go back into the economy because they're going to be buying things with it uh, here's another image of uh, men in Toronto uh, protesting that their government helped them out. Canada enacted a similar program to the New Deal as well and other countries followed suit um, and it's there is some evidence to suggest that uh, these initiatives did start to turn the page on the Great Depression. But the real event that moved us out of the Great Depression would be World War II. So we'll be talking about World War II in a moment. But first, we're going to turn back to Russia and uh, the communist revolution. So as we talked about in the last podcast, in 1917, there was a revolution in Russia uh, right towards the end of the war. Now, normally it's called a communist revolution, but that's only because it was the communists who ultimately prevailed. But the revolution was really a revolution against the autocratic rule of the czar of Russia. That is the, uh, the king or the emperor of Russia, Nicholas II. Um, and the revolutionaries were made up of not just communists, but socialists and, and also um uh, liberal Democrats and all just sort of different groups of people, all of whom shared one common goal, which is that they wanted to end the autocratic rule of the czar. However, it would ultimately be the communists who would prevail. And this was a communism that was based on the ideas of Karl Marx and Friedrich Engel that we talked about before from the early 19th century, something that came out directly of the Industrial Revolution. Um, by 1922, the Russian Empire then, emerging from this revolution, was renamed the Union of Soviet Socialist Republics, the USSR, and its first leader was Vladimir Lenin, who would be in control until 1924. And here you see an image of Lenin speaking to a crowd in 1920. Now, in many ways, Russia is um, an unlikely candidate for a communist revolution, at least if you are basing it off what Karl Marx envisioned uh, for the natural progression of communist revolution. So Marx had written that he believed that history was an inevitable movement towards communism. He uh, talked about how in the Middle Ages, the noble classes were overthrown by the bourgeoisie, the middle classes. And to a certain extent, that's not entirely untrue. Um, and he believed that one day the proletariat or the working class would also try to overthrow the middle class. But he believed that that would be a consequence of the Industrial Revolution, that the conditions of factories and so forth would inspire workers to eventually take the means of production into their own hands and overthrow the factory owners. Now, here's where Russia doesn't fit the pattern. Russia was not heavily industrialized. Um, although Russian, Russia had a few factories, it was nowhere near what other countries in Europe were like in terms of its road to industrialization. Um, Vladimir Lenin believed that Russia could skip over the industrialization period and go straight to uh, a revolution. And this is just one of many ways in which uh, Lenin's version of communism differed from Karl Marx's version of communism. So Marxism versus Leninism. And uh, over time, Russian communism would really take on its own characteristics, which are very different in many ways than um, what uh, Karl Marx envisioned in his original writings in the mid 19th century. Um, so once the Bolsheviks uh, seized control, the Bolsheviks were the party, the political party that Lenin belonged to. They immediately set about to uh, create their ideal communist society. They abolished the private ownership of land. They nationalized banks and industry. And in order to solidify their power, they ended true democracy. Um, they also ended the Russian involvement in World War I. They made peace with Germany and pulled out of the war. Now that part was popular. Uh, the war had been very, very, uh, gone very badly for Russia. Um, it was deeply unpopular and pulling out of the war was something that um, uh, was a move that was broadly supported by the Russian populace. 
However, in order to maintain control, uh, Lenin um, began to uh, arrange for his political opponents to be shot or to be exiled or imprisoned. He created a secret police force um, and he spent much of his time trying to put down a civil war. Um, their control was never quite complete, um, so he went about to make a clean break with the past. He had the Tsar and his family, who had been held under house arrest, executed in July of 1918. The civil war within Russia would continue ultimately until 1923, when finally the last of the um, resistance to the Bolsheviks having complete control over Russia was finally done away, and Lenin was in complete control. Unfortunately for Lenin, he didn't live long after that victory. He died of a brain hemorrhage um, in 1924. He, he was just 54 years of age. Now, uh, Lenin had been, you know, pretty nasty with secret police and killing his rivals, but he was nothing compared to the man who followed him. Uh, here you see um, uh, his uh, successor, Joseph Stalin, who uh, is there chatting with Lenin in 1921. Joseph uh, Stalin, once he assumed control, he immediately uh, followed best practices and killed all of his uh, rivals. Um, but Stalin was um, determined to make sure that Russia became an industrial powerhouse. So remember, as I had said before, Russia didn't have very many factories. Well, um, Joseph Stalin um, uh, tried to change that, but it came with a dramatically high human cost. Um, uh, forced, uh, he forced people to um, collectivize agriculture, so people were forced to move on to commune farms. Other people were forced to work in factories. And once we entered into the Great Depression, he ended up uh, exporting grain, selling it for money while people were starving in the 1930s. So although Russia was producing record amounts of grain, uh, Stalin was selling it in order to support his industrial growth policy. Uh, so here's an image uh, which demonstrates the collectivization in Soviet agriculture. So uh, this is a uh, particular collective farm not far from Moscow, and the women stand uh, for the morning roll call. The Soviet collectivization effort of the 1930s rested in an important measure on the forced mobilization of peasant women. So here they all are ba basically being forced to do work together on a government-owned farm. So now I want to turn back to Italy and talk about how Italy ultimately would be transformed into a new type of government, a type of government we call fascism, and it would uh, get under the control of uh, a dictator named Mussolini. Uh, so after World War I, Italy did not fare very well. Although Italy had been on the winning side of the war, uh, it was not really given much of a seat at the bargaining table at the Treaty of Versailles. It was considered a lesser player in the war, and so it didn't get the big reparation payments that Britain and France were getting. And so Italy really had um, terrible economic conditions throughout the 1920s, while the rest of Europe um, and the United States were uh, entering into a period of prosperity, Italy never really went into that. Um, this is where Bendito Mussolini comes into play. As a young man, he did all sorts of things. He worked in a newspaper, um, but he managed to become uh, the prime minister of Italy in 1922, and he very quickly um, uh, took over and became a dictator from 1925 onward. Uh, and again, he did so by using brutal means. He had um, brown shirts that he used as thugs to beat up his uh, rivals and, and uh, terrorize anyone who stood in his way. Um, he developed a new concept of government that was called fascism. And this was meant to be an alternative to socialism and conventional democracy. The idea was to take the best parts of socialism from his point of view and the best parts of a capitalist democracy and combine them together to create this new movement called socialism. So what is fascism? This new political philosophy that uh, Mussolini invented. Well, the word itself is derived from the ancient Latin word fasces, which was a bundle of sticks attached to an axe. In ancient Rome, it was used as a symbol of a magistrate's power. It would have been something that um, he would have held. 
Um, and the reason why Mussolini essentially chose it as the name for his movement is it's part of an imagined glorious past. It's harking back to the time when Italy was literally the most powerful um, place in the Western world, when, when it was the center of ancient Roman civilization and the Roman Empire. Now, fascism itself is kind of peculiar. It takes ideas from both the left of the political spectrum and the right of the political spectrum. On the left of the political spectrum, it takes ideas of socialism. So under fascism, often you have government run industry. You also have a social safety net. Um, however, it also takes ideas from the right. It has an emphasis on traditional values. It has an emphasis on militarism as well. And so borrowing from the left and the right, fascism really is a sort of unique political movement. Um, and what also is a important characteristic is that fascism unites under a single leader. It often is associated with a cult of personality. So in Italy, it was under the complete control of the leader or the El Duce, which was Mussolini. So fascism would turn out to be an attractive concept to other leaders in Europe as well, too. And in particular, it would influence this person, Adolf Hitler. Uh, here you see Adolf Hitler giving a speech um, uh, when the Nuremberg Laws were announced in 1935. These were horribly anti-Semitic laws which lay the groundwork for the Holocaust in which uh, millions of Jewish people would be murdered. Um, now, the party that Hitler would eventually take over, the Nazi party, it emerged after World War I. And at the time, uh, in its original incarnation, it was basically a working class party. It was relatively angry. It did have um, twinges of, of racism and anti-Semitism. But really, it would um, transform under the leadership of Adolf Hitler. Hitler fell in with the party in the early 1920s and he rose to the ranks and eventually he became the party leader and he remodeled it after Mussolini's version of fascism. Now, just like Mussolini uh, originally came to power by being elected as prime minister and only once in power did he dismantle democracy, um, Hitler followed a similar path. So in 1933, Hitler was elected as chancellor, and it was afterwards that Hitler used um, uh, his own powers to essentially dismantle the democratic system that had brought him there, and he became a dictator shortly after, just like Mussolini. And this would allow Hitler to remodel German society under the same fascist lines as Mussolini. But it wouldn't be quite the same. Hitler's version of fascism has some unique characteristics that Mussolini's doesn't have. The Nazi ideology that Hitler espoused was built on a foundation of racism and social Darwinism. So anti-Semitism specifically. Uh, so uh, Hitler um, despised Jewish people and um, he was tapping into an undercurrent of German society that used Jewish people who were a minority in German society as scapegoats for a lot of the problems that Germans felt. They were an easy scapegoat. Um, uh, there was the wide held belief, falsely held, that it had been Jews, German Jews, who had allowed World War I to be lost for Germany. And this is all tied up as well in sort of a warped concept of social Darwinism, the idea that it is normal for one race to uh, go to war and fight against other races, just like in nature, if you're strong enough to kill another race, then that legitimizes it. And this is sort of the building blocks under which Nazi ideology was formed. There was also a concept that Hitler espoused called Lebensraum, which is essentially that the German people were entitled to more living space. That again, might equals right. And that if Germans have the power to take it from others, then that justifies the taking. Um, he also espoused the idea that, that Jews were less than human, that they were some sort of parasite on human society, and therefore uh, Germans could be justified first in enacting laws which would marginalize them and later um, murdering them in death camps. And above and beyond all of this, there was uh, an undercurrent myth that, of the Aryans and that the Germans were part of some sort of a superior master race and that this was their destiny to seize control of the world. So a whole lot of nonsense, but powerful nonsense that a lot of people believed.
During the 1930s, as Hitler um, uh, solidified his control of Germany and transformed German society, he was, broadly speaking, amongst uh, Germans, very popular. Um, uh, even at the same time, he was passing horribly racist legislation, such as the Nuremberg Laws, and acting as a dictator and dismantling democracy around him. At least on the surface, he had seemed to turn around the German economy, and in many respects, his unapologetic stance towards uh, the Treaty of Versailles, which was universally detested within Germany, and the fact that he was seen to have stood up to outside powers and to have given Germany back their pride again. Uh, led to even outsiders such as the uh, American Time magazine naming him Man of the Year in 1938, which just absolutely seems absurd from our point of view today. Uh, nevertheless, this was the environment in the 1930s which allowed Hitler to get away with as much as he did until eventually um, uh, his exploits would go too far and we would find ourselves back in a world war once again. Which brings us to World War II. The second global war lasted from 1939 to 1945, and it is by far the most destructive war in history. Even to this day, nothing has come close to it. Approximately 75 million people died. It was also the very first and only, knock on wood, war to use nuclear weapons. You see a picture there of the atomic bombing of Nagasaki in Japan in 1945 when the Americans dropped a nuclear bomb on Japan, effectively ending World War II. To put it into perspective just how uh, much more destructive World War II is, let's take a look at it in comparison to World War I. So in World War I, there were approximately 17 million deaths. In World War II, there were 75 million deaths. The difference is absolutely staggering. From World War II, we would actually also have color photography for the very first time. During the Second World War, women in many countries would actually serve in uniform for the first time. This is a rare color image of the Auxiliary Territorial Service ATS plotters at work at the Coastal Artillery Headquarters in Dover, England in December of 1942. Once again, Europe would be um, nearly destroyed by the fighting during World War II, but it wasn't just in Europe. The war would be fought all around the world once more. This would be a war where airplanes would play a greater role than ever before. Here you see an image of uh, RAF uh, fitters changing the engine of a Lockheed Hudson at Yandun in the Gambia in April of 1943. And here's an image of Lancaster bombers nearing completion in Avro's assembly plant at Woodford in Manchester in 1943. Tanks, which were only first invented in the First World War and played a really limited role in that war, would now be more important than ever before. Here's an image of a Churchill crocodile flamethrower tank in action in August of 1944. World War II would be the ultimate clash of civilizations. On one side, the free democratic world rallied to stop Hitler, who wanted to institute his Third Reich, which was the official name that the Nazis gave to Germany under Hitler's leadership. The Third Reich, the idea being that the first uh, empire was the Holy Roman Empire during the Middle Ages. The second empire was the empire instituted under Otto von Bismarck, um, and the Kaiser with German unification, and now the Third Reich uh, being under Hitler. The underside of the war would see untold human misery and cruelty and the murdering of over six million Jewish people by the Nazis and many others too. The principal consequences of World War II would be the end of European world dominance. Europe would be so devastated by the end of World War II that it would no longer be the principal uh, controller of the world. And in fact, it would also lead to decolonization in much of the rest of the world as Europeans find it impossible to keep up their former empires. In decolonization, we also see the spread of mass society to the rest of the world. And in the ashes of World War II, we see the redistribution of world power between two superpowers, the United States and the USSR, and the beginning of the Cold War. 
through the overview of World War II, um, um, uh, pit similar uh, countries against um, uh, each other that were fighting in World War I. So on the Allied side, we have Britain, France, all the Commonwealth countries, which includes Canada. We also have China this time around. The USSR, at least uh, after June of 1941, which is what Russia is now called, and the United States also after June 1941. The introduction of these two countries into the war would prove pivotal. On the other side, on what would be known as the Axis powers, we have Germany and Japan this time, also allied with Germany. Uh, Japan, of course, fought on the Allied side during World War I. Well, things have changed a lot since the First World War, and Japan now is a major power in its own right. Italy also changes sides. Italy will fight on German side as well, and Hungary. So one way to understand World War II is to think of it as two separate conflicts that end up joining together. So there was a conflict in Asia and a conflict in Europe. And these conflicts eventually get bigger and bigger, and eventually they join up together. And that's really what World War II is. So let's take a look at what was going on in Asia. So in Asia, the main destabilizing factor is the rise of Japan as a, an imperial power. So uh, Japan, as I hinted at in the last podcast, was a bit different in its reaction to imperialism of, uh, of Europeans. Japan, once it encountered um, the Europeans' power and uh, understood uh, industrialization, took it upon themselves to completely transform the country. This was a process known as the Meiji Restoration. And the Meiji Restoration slowly saw Japan, uh, Japan become an industrial power. In World War I, they fought in the war and contributed quite a bit. But by World War II, they were a major industrial power in their own right. Now, this is happening in the backdrop that a neighboring country, China, was doing the opposite. China was very slow to respond to industrialization, whereas Japan quickly industrialized. This imbalance of power left Japan the opportunity to start uh, gaining more territory at China's expense. In 1931, Japan, Japan invaded Manchuria, which is basically modern day Korea. And this essentially is the beginning of World War II. Um, it's not the official beginning of World War II, but there will be nonstop war in this part of the world until 1945 when, the, when World War II finally comes to an end. So you could say that the invasion of Manchuria in 1931 is really what starts it. Um, Japan invaded China in 1937, and at this point now we are truly into a full-blown war in Asia. Now why is Japan doing this? Because Japan can. Japan is an ambitious country. It has its own imperialistic ambitions. So in many ways it adopted all kinds of ideas from Europe, not just the industrial part, but also the imperial part as well, too. So as uh, Asia falls into full-blown war, things are rocketing towards conflict in Europe as well. We see the rise of fascism in both Italy and Germany during the 1920s and 1930s. So Mussolini is dictator from 1925 onward, El Duce, and Hitler becomes dictator from 1933 onward, Der Führer. Um, we also start to see, uh, at least in, in, in Mussolini's instance, that we see some ambitions beyond their own countries. So Mussolini, for example, invades Ethiopia in 1935. Why? Because he could invade Ethiopia and because he wanted to start to create an Italian empire of sorts as well, too. And in Germany, we start to see increasing anti-Semitism as Hitler begins to remodel the country. So Hitler also had his territorial ambitions too. Remember the concept of Lebensraum, which means living space. Uh, and Hitler certainly intended to increase uh, German territory. Now some of that territory he intended to regain what was lost during World War I and arguably was uh, taken away from Germany unfairly. But he also had his eye on other parts of Europe which had never been part of Germany before. And the rest of Europe and the world we have to understand that nobody, nobody wanted to have a war again. So there was a reluctance to confront Hitler in some of these ambitions because World War I had been so terrible. So many people had died. And also there was an understanding that, you know, the Treaty of Versailles had been somewhat unfair to Germany. And so we should be flexible to some degree or another in order to prevent war and maintain world peace. 
this would bring about the idea of appeasement. So appeasement is uh, most commonly associated with the uh, man on the left who was the British Prime Minister. His name was Neville Chamberlain. So Neville Chamberlain had uh, many meetings with Adolf Hitler over the years in the lead up to World War II. And he tried to do everything he possibly could to avoid a war taking place. Appeasement essentially means that they kind of let Hitler get away with certain things with the understanding that Hitler wouldn't take it too far and uh, that if he did, then we would be back at war again. And nobody wanted that. So they were going to try everything they could to avoid getting us into a major conflict. But Hitler would certainly begin to push the boundaries. So one of the first um, uh, uh, ways that Germany began to increase its territory was with the Saar. So the Saar was a, um, a small territory that at the end of World War I had been separated from Germany. It's that little area in red. And France was given control of its Saar mines. In 1935, there was a referendum of whether Saar wanted to um, be rejoined with the German territory. The territorial status referendum took place on January 13th, 1935, and over 90% of the Saar voters uh, opted for reunification uh, with Germany. And the rest of the world, when this happened, I mean, France was not pleased with it, but at the same time, they thought, well, you know, the Saar used to be part of Germany, and so we really should just let this take place, and so everyone just kind of let it happen. So that's, this is the first territorial acquisition of Germany. It wouldn't be the last. So the next thing that uh, Hitler did was he focused on rebuilding the German military. Um, one area of Germany, the Rhineland, at the end of World War I, the Rhineland, it's this area in yellow here by the Rhine River, had come under the occupation of the Allied forces. Um, in the Treaty of Versailles, a German military presence was forbidden from all territory west of the Rhine and within 50 kilometers east of the Rhine. And this was later uh, reaffirmed with uh, the Lorcano Treaties of 1925 that this would be a permanently demilitarized zone. Zone. In 1929, however, Germany uh, began to negotiate the withdrawal of Allied forces from the land, and the last Allied soldiers left the Rhineland in 1930. Following uh, the Nazis coming to power in 1933, Germany began working towards rearmament and the militarization of the Rhineland. Um, the reason why they wanted Germany not to have soldiers there is because it's right on the border, border of Belgium. This is where so much fighting had taken place during World War I. Um, and then in 1936, Hitler finally broke all those treaties and ordered uh, 3,000 German troops to move into the Rhineland. Now, this was celebrated in Germany because they just loved the idea that Hitler was standing up to the Allied powers. What did the Allied powers do? Well kind of nothing nobody wanted war and everyone a lot of people argued well is it fair to say that germany can't have military in its own land was that really fair and so they didn't do anything and here you see german troops marching into the rhineland in 1936 and the people all happy and ecstatic you see women giving the soldiers flowers so from the German point of view, this was a celebrated moment, a moment where they were standing up to the Allied powers, they were re getting back some of their dignity after World War I, and the rest of Europe kind of nervously sat on their hands and hoped against hope that this would be the end of Hitler's ambitions. Again, this is all about appeasement. At the time, they wanted to avoid war. However, Hitler's next move was much more provocative. In 1938, Hitler marched his troops south and annexed the country of Austria. Uh, the Austrian government fled, and this was a major provocation. Now, however, most of the people in Austria welcomed the Germans when they came. Uh, Hitler was a popular figure. He was seen to be a um, someone who had turned the German economy around, and the Austrian government was not very popular at the time. And the rest of the world nervously watched as Hitler annexed this whole country. And what did they do? They didn't do anything because they thought, well, 
well, Austria is filled with German-speaking people, so yeah, maybe Germany and Austria being together, that's not such a big deal, I guess. Besides, we really, really, really don't want war. And here you see cheering crowds in Vienna, Austria, as the Germans come in and the Nazis take over. Again, generally speaking, in Austria, uh, this was, people liked it. Um, watch the sound of music for this period of history uh, being depicted. So next, Hitler turned his attention to a region of Czechoslovakia known as the Sudetenland. So the Sudetenland was a part of Czechoslovakia that was essentially filled with German people, German-speaking people and people who were culturally German. The reason why it was part of Czechoslovakia was because of the reorganization after World War I. Originally, the Sudetenland had been part of the Austria-Hungary Empire, um, but after that disintegrated, um, it was given to the new country of Czechoslovakia. Um, so, you know, at this point when Hitler was making motions towards the Sudetenland, obviously the Czechoslovakians didn't like it, but we still had the same situation, that the rest of Europe really, really, really didn't want war. And, you know, certainly the argument would have been made, well, you know, yes, it's not part of Germany, but it's part of Czechoslovakia, but it is filled with German-speaking people, so maybe we can all um, look away while he takes that, maybe? But things were getting serious. This was, I mean, it was quite clear to everyone that Hitler was on, um, you know, a shopping spree of territory around Germany, and this really had to come to an end. So our friend Neville Chamberlain, the Prime Minister of Britain, met with Adolf Hitler another time in 1938. And his goal this time was try to get Hitler to agree to stop gobbling up more territories in Europe and hurtling uh, the world towards war. Um, no representatives from Czechoslovakia were brought in to um, uh, have a say in what became known as the Munich Agreement of 1938. But in that agreement, and this is the pinnacle of appeasement, in that agreement, uh, Hitler agreed that he would stop um, any more territorial acquisitions in return for the Sudetenland. He said, okay, look, look, I, I know that I annexed Austria. I know that, you know, we got the Tsar uh, in a referendum, and I know I started remilitarizing the Rhineland, but I promise, honest to goodness, that this is it, that the Sudetenland is the last thing I'm going to take. And Neville Chamberlain shook hands with him, and that was the agreement. And of course, we all know that this didn't end well. So despite the fact that um, Czechoslovakia really didn't like this idea, they didn't want to give up their territory willingly, the fact that the rest of the world did not want to go to bat for them meant that there was nothing they could do. They just had to accept the Munich Agreement, and Hitler was able to ride into the Sudetenland without even firing a shot. And like he had in other places, this was largely German-speaking peoples, and, and he was very popular amongst German-speaking peoples, and so he was meted by adoring crowds, like what you see here in September of 1938. So obviously, lots of things have happened over the past five years, and Europe has done everything they can to try to avoid war, led by Neville Chamberlain and this policy of appeasement, which is they've been trying to appease Hitler. Uh, so Neville Chamberlain announced uh, the results of the agreement to the rest of the world um, and hoping that this would be the end of German territorial expansion. The settlement of the Czechoslovakian problem, which has now been achieved, is, in my view, only the prelude to a larger settlement in which all Europe may find peace. This morning, I had another talk with the German Chancellor, Herr Hitler. And here is the paper which bears his name upon it as well as mine. Some of you perhaps have already heard what it contains, but I would just like to read it to you. We, the German Führer and Chancellor, 
and the British Prime Minister have had a further meeting today and are agreed in recognizing that the question of Anglo-German relations is of the first importance for the two countries and for Europe. We regard the agreement signed last night and the Anglo-German naval agreement as symbolic of the desire of our two peoples never to go to war with one another again. Of course, as we know, Hitler had no intention of stopping there. He had every intention of continuing on. So in order to start to make real preparations for the inevitable war that was going to follow, Hitler made some alliances. So first he made an alliance with his buddy Mussolini. And why not? Mussolini and Hitler were both fascists. They liked to talk about fascist things. And although uh, in private Hitler considered Mussolini a bit of an idiot and um, uh, didn't really respect him that much, uh, in May 1939 they signed the Pact of Steel, uniting them in an alliance. The final chess piece that Hitler needed to put into place before he began his next move was to make a secret agreement with the Soviet Union, with Joseph Stalin. Uh, this was achieved with the Molotov-Ribbentrop Act in 1939. This pact um, essentially would divide up the country of Poland between the two countries, because that was going to be Hitler's next move. He was planning on invading Poland. So here you see Poland is right between the Soviet Union and Germany. So clearly had Germany just invaded Poland without uh, the Soviet Union's agreement, uh, that would have almost certainly provoked war between the two countries, which Hitler wasn't quite ready to have happen. Um, now, I think Hitler realized that uh, going into Poland was probably a bridge too far. After all, all of those other arguments were based on the idea that, you know, there were German people there and it made sense for Germany to absorb German speaking people. But in Poland, there are Polish speaking people. And it really, you know, there's no excuse other than pure territorial ambition, which would cause uh, Germany to want to invade Poland. And indeed, this was all about Lebensraum. That means, you know, more living space for German people. Um, and Germany, against the agreement that he would made uh, with uh, the British Prime Minister Neville Chamberlain, um, invaded uh, Poland in September of 1939. And this was it. This was the final straw. The rest of the world finally got off their hands and decided they had to do something about Hitler. So here you see German troops parading through Warsaw after the invasion of uh, Poland. This time, no cheering crowds. Things are starting to get nasty. I am speaking to you from the cabinet room at 10 Downing Street. This morning, the British ambassador in Berlin handed the German government a final note stating that unless we heard from them by 11 o'clock that they were prepared at once to withdraw their troops from Poland, a state of war would exist between us. I have to tell you now that no such undertaking has been received and that consequently this country is at war with Germany. You can imagine what a bitter blow it is to me that all my long struggle to win peace has failed. Yet I cannot believe that there is anything more or anything different that I could have done and that would have been more successful. Up to the very last, it would have been quite possible to have arranged a peaceful and honourable settlement between Germany and Poland. But Hitler would not have it. He had evidently made up his mind to attack Poland, whatever happened. And although he now says he put forward reasonable proposals which were rejected by the Poles, that is not a true statement. The proposals were never shown to the Poles, nor to us. And though they were announced in the German broadcast on Thursday night, Hitler did not wait to hear comments on them 
had ordered his troops to cross the Polish frontier the next morning. His action shows convincingly that there is no chance of expecting that this man will ever give up his practice of using force to gain his will. He can only be stopped by force. And we and France are today, in fulfillment of our obligations, going to the aid of Poland, who is so bravely resisting this wicked and unprovoked attack upon her people. We have a clear conscience. We have done all that any country could do to establish peace. But a situation in which no word given by Germany's ruler could be trusted, and no people or country could feel itself safe, had become intolerable. And now that we have resolved to finish it, I know that you will all play your part with calmness and courage. So after that very sad speech where Neville Chamberlain admitted that his whole policy of appeasement had not worked, Britain was at war with um, uh, Germany, and uh, lots of the rest of the world followed suit, certainly all of the Commonwealth countries. So Canada uh, went uh, declared war with the Nazis um, uh, very shortly thereafter, and other countries followed suit. Notably not the United States, though. Just like the First World War, they will stay out of this war for the first bit. So the early part of the war did not go well at all for the Allied forces. Uh, Germany had an initial wave of success. And part of this was because of the strategy that Hitler and the Nazis adopted at the beginning, which was something they called the Blitzkrieg strategy. Uh, the Blitzkrieg strategy was using a huge army of basically all tanks, um, which could move incredibly quickly um, across the countryside and then coupled that with air support. This allowed the Germans to, within six weeks, defeat France in 1940. So here you see Hitler um, walking through occupied Paris with the Eiffel Tower in the background. Um, so it, it just was not going very well at all. At the same time, Germany began a campaign of bombing British cities. Um, uh, the uh, Blitz would act actually turn London um, uh, into rubble and people would be forced to uh, spend their nights um, in the subway system, the underground, in order to just to survive. Um, and Germany also um, sent out submarines and destroyed Allied shipping lines. Um, they pretty much controlled the Atlantic in the beginning of the war. So things were not going very well at all. So this map, I think, is really a great way of just presenting how bad the war was going for the Allies in the beginning. So this is a map of Europe in 1941, and everywhere you see that is gray or black is under the control of Hitler's Germany and Mussolini's Italy. But as I had said before, Mussolini was really the junior partner in this relationship. So let's just state the obvious. It's all under the control of Nazis and, and Hitler. And you can imagine that if you were um, in the United Kingdom right now, that lone country on the edge of Europe that's not been taken over by the Nazis, you are genuinely terrified at this point. Things are not going well. So this is where the war, the two wars that I've described, the war in Asia and the war in Europe are going to join up together and it's going to turn into a world war. And it happens because Japan and Germany form an alliance. So why would they do this? Well, it's because they both see a common enemy. Although uh, Germany had formed that secret agreement with the Soviet Union, Hitler knew that sooner or later he was going to have to deal with Stalin, that uh, Stalin was not just going to sit idly by as Germany solidified its position across all of Western Europe, because that would be a long term threat to Joseph Stalin. And so he knew that eventually the Soviet Union was going to turn on him. So he took preparations to make sure that he was um, going to make it as difficult as possible for them and so one way to do that would be to form an alliance with Japan because Japan is on the other side of the Soviet Union likewise Japan also sees the Soviet Union as a threat because as Japan is building up its empire um, in Asia it knows that eventually the Soviet Union is going to not like that either because it would be a threat to them so both the two countries see uh, the Soviet Union as a threat and so they make an alliance in 1940
So while Hitler was engaged in his war with the rest of Europe, he continued his internal war against uh, Jewish people. In any of the areas that he occupied, uh, the Jewish people living there increased in, uh, faced increasing restrictions in Nazi-occupied Europe. Um, uh, they created ghettos in cities beginning in 1940. So they forced Jewish people from their homes and forced them to congregate and live in these very, very, very small, dense, packed urban areas where people were living practically on top of one another and where uh, disease could run rampant. The conditions in the ghettos were terrible. There often was not enough food. Um, and uh, that was only the beginning of what was going to happen. Um, in the beginning, the Nazis uh, conducted a policy where they wanted to encourage emigration. They wanted to encourage Jewish people to leave Nazi-occupied area. Uh, however, about um, from 1940 onward, this changed uh, from a policy of emigration uh, to extermination. And essentially, the doors were shut from that point onward, and the Nazis focused just on killing Jewish people. Uh, from 1941 onward, uh, the Nazis um, utilized death squads and pogroms. Pogroms are basically where they would give um, carte blanche to uh, private citizens to essentially create uh, lynching gangs, uh, which could go around and kill Jewish people without any uh, fear of censure. So in the late 1930s, uh, Jewish people were desperately trying to get out of Europe before those doors shut. One horribly shameful example in Canadian history is when the German transatlantic liner St. Louis arrived in Canada in 1939. On board the St. Louis were 900 Jewish refugees who were seeking sanctuary from Nazi Germany. Um, Canada, under the direction of the Prime Minister Mackenzie King, turned them away. They were also refused entry into the United States. Uh, the ship was forced to return to occupied Europe. Um, nearly half of the people on that ship would ultimately die in the Holocaust, uh, which is just an all incredibly uh, sad and shameful part of uh, our country's history that we turn them away in that time of need. You know, generally speaking, um, quite a bit of the anti-Semitism and the laws against um, uh, against Jewish people were widely uh, supported. Uh, by uh, German people. There were, um, uh, you know, movements to boycott Jewish stores to, uh, so here's a, a picture um, of a sign used during an anti-Jewish boycott and it says, help Germany from Jewish capital, don't buy in Jewish stores. And this is from uh, 1933 in the lead up to the war. Obviously, um, uh, things would get a lot worse for Jewish people over time. In the beginning, it started just as a widespread state sponsor sponsored, sponsored anti-Semitism, and eventually um, Jewish people are forced to identify themselves using Stars of David and are forced to move into ghettos. So uh, the deportation of Jews to extermination camps uh, began about a month after uh, the introduction of the Star Badges, the Star of David Badges, which uh, Jews were uh, required to wear in occupied Europe. Um, the death camps um, and the concentration camps would take the Holocaust to a whole new level. So what the Nazis called the final solution began in earnest in 1942. No longer were Jews allowed to leave occupied Europe. From now on, the Nazis would concentrate on murdering them. Uh, the emergence of death camps were essentially factories of death. They were designed to kill masses amounts of people in the most efficient way possible. One of those death, death camps was uh, the Auschwitz concentration camp. And you see Jewish people uh, in this picture arriving at the camp in May of 1944. Uh, most people would be dead within hours after arriving on trains in the camp. Um, the only people who would be spared even for a short period of time would be young, healthy men, and only because they needed the labor to dispose of bodies. Uh, women and children and old people were killed uh, within just a, a few hours of arriving at the camp. Uh, they used gas chambers in order to efficiently murder as many people as possible. They had crematoria set up to burn the bodies. All of this was designed to depersonalize killing on a mass scale. This was uh, the bureaucratized and government sanctioned murder of over 6 million Jewish people. 
So eventually things turn around. 1941 is the year that it happens, the turning point in the war. And there's two major events which turn the tide against the Axis powers, against Germany, Italy, and Japan. The first major event is a complete strategic um, misstep by Hitler. He decides to invade the Soviet Union in June of 1941. Now, if you recall from this course, we've talked about this already. Generally speaking, in history, it is a very, very bad idea to invade Russia, as Napoleon found out a century earlier. Um, when Germany invaded the Soviet Union, they faced incredibly fierce resistance. Soviet Union is a very large place. They also uh, had to transverse this huge country. The Russians um, followed the same strategy they always had, which is to withdraw, let the troops come in, and then attack fiercely once winter comes. And Germany was not well equipped for winter. So you might wonder, why on earth did Hitler make this mistake? Um, partially it was because he felt that war with the Soviet Union was inevitable, that sooner or later uh, Stalin was going to attack him because he was had so much success in Western Europe that, that this just proved to be too much of a threat for Stalin and that a war was going to come one way or another and Hitler preferred to choose it on his own terms. The other is a little bit of hubris, no doubt. Hitler had had great success that far, far in the war and he really thought that his success would continue. It didn't. Uh, the invasion of the Soviet Union turned out to be a disaster. The German army was essentially uh, stuck um, at uh, Stalingrad, where there was fierce fighting for over a year. Uh, there you see a soldier, a Russian soldier, uh, waving uh, the red banner over the central plaza of Stalingrad in 1943. So the uh, Soviet invasion not going very well at all. A similar strategic misstep was made by the Japanese. And we'll see that next. So just a, a few months after Germany invades Russia, Japan decides to attack the United States, bringing the United States into the war. Now, why did Japan do this? So as Japan, like uh, this uh, Germany, had had lots of success and was expanding in Asia and into the Pacific, they felt that sooner or later, America was going to go to war against them, that America would not let them continue to uh, gobble up all of these territories in the Pacific because it was going to butt up against American interests. And perhaps they were right. But the truth is, is that at that point in time, there was little appetite for war within the United States. Like the First World War, there was generally an isolationist um, uh, vibe in the air, so to speak. However, Japan completely um, uh, misjudged uh, what the reaction would be uh, to the bombing of the naval base at Pearl Harbor in Hawaii. Um, uh, Japan believed that if it could strike a decisive blow against the Americans by bombing their main naval base, that it would so demoralize the Americans that they would sue for peace immediately and they would, you know, with their tail between their legs, um, you know, uh, back off and allow Japan to keep all of their possessions in the Pacific. Well, that is obviously not what happened at all. All at once, he uh, unified the country and America was able to turn its industrial might. And I say industrial might because at this point in time, America really had already begun its path to becoming a superpower. Um, and when America turns all of its factories onto the war effort, and remember, it had also sat out the war up until this point, so its soldiers were fresh, uh, it was a major turning point in the war. So for Germany, Japan, and Italy, things were now going to uh, take a turn for the worse. The bombing of uh, Pearl Harbor was, in retrospect, a complete strategic blunder on the part of the Japanese. So all at once now, uh, there was the Soviet Union on one side of Japan, on the other side, they had um, uh, the United States of America, and in Europe, now Germany had to contend with a war on two fronts. Uh, they had the Soviet Union on one side, and then they had the looming, likely invasion, reinvasion of Europe that was almost certainly going to come on the coast somewhere of France, where nobody knew, uh, but it was going to come. So after 1943, we are entering into the final stages of the war. On June 6, 1944, the long-awaited and anticipated Allied D-Day invasion of Normandy began. D-Day was the largest seaborne invasion in history. The operation began the liberation of German-occupied France and later Western Europe, and it laid the foundations for the Allied victory on the Western Front. 
Between 1944 and 1945, Germany found itself slowly surrounded. On one side, it had Britain and Canada and other Commonwealth countries, the United States invading, and on the other side, it had the Soviet Union. In April of 1945, with Soviet troops at the doorstep of his bunker in Berlin, Hitler committed suicide along with his mistress, Eva Braun. A month later, Germany surrendered in May of 1945. The war in Europe was finally over. However, the war in uh, the Pacific continued on for some time. So uh, throughout the uh, latter stages of the war, the United States had been secretly working on a project that was dubbed the Manhattan Project. And it was a collective effort of many different scientists to develop the very first nuclear weapon. The Pacific War was uh, not going very well. Although the United States was slowly uh, pushing the Japanese back, going island to island, the Japanese were not likely going to surrender. A decision was made by the President of the United States, which remains controversial to this day, to use the very first nuclear weapons in warfare, and in fact the only times that nuclear weapons have ever been used in warfare. An atomic bomb was dropped on the Japanese cities of Hiroshima and Nagasaki in August of 1945, and this finally resulted in the Japanese surrendering. World War II was finally over. So in 1945, the deadliest conflict in the history of the human race had finally come to a conclusion. And yet, just as it was ending, a new conflict was beginning, and this would be a very different one. The so-called Cold War would see the world divided between two superpowers, the United States and the Soviet Union. Now, towards the end of the war, um, most people knew that this conflict was likely coming. Although the Soviet Union and the United States were on the same side, both saw that the uh, destruction of Germany and Japan was inevitable. What came next was what was on everyone's mind. Although the United States was the first country to develop nuclear weapons, the Soviet Union was not far behind them, and within a couple of years after the end of World War II, they tested their own nuclear weapons. And this would begin a nuclear arms race between the two countries. Really what we see is competing world ideologies, a form of communism versus capitalism. The entire world was essentially divided between their two spheres of influence. On one side, we had the liberal democracies led by the United States. On the other side, we saw Soviet communism, a so-called Iron Curtain descended across Europe. That's what Winston Churchill called it. And on one side of the Iron Curtain were all of the uh, Soviet countries that had been gobbled up during World War II um, as the Soviet Union had pushed Germany back. The dividing line really fought, fell within Germany itself. Uh, Germany was divided up between the two victoring powers. And so um, on one side we had uh, West Germany, which would be under the control of the um, uh, Western powers. And Western Germany would join that alliance of Western powers and join NATO, which would be uh, the alliance between them. On the other side would be the Soviet Union and the Warsaw Pact, all of the Soviet uh, countries. Now, because the two uh, powers couldn't directly fight one another, and the obvious reason why they couldn't fight one another is because to do so would end the world as we know it. It would be a nuclear war, and a nuclear war would destroy the entire planet. And so the war never could get hot, which is why they called it a Cold War. Instead, the Cold War was fought through proxies and satellite or friendly states. That means that since the Soviet Union and the United States couldn't fight directly, they fought through others. So one example of where the Cold War becomes hot is in the Korean War. So in the 1950s, there was a civil war in Korea. On one side of the conflict was uh, a communist uh, north, which was supported by the Soviet Union. And the southern part of Korea was supported by the United States. The Korean War was fought to a stalemate. And in fact, uh, that division is still there today between North and South Korea. A similar conflict is the Vietnam War. Uh, in which, um, again, uh, a civil war broke out in the country of Vietnam. One side was communist, the other side was capitalist. The Americans fought on the capitalist side. 
Now, as a rule, whenever one uh, of the two superpowers directly gets involved in a conflict, which the Americans did in Vietnam, uh, the other side can't get involved. So just as in Korea and in Vietnam, the Americans actually fought, the Soviet Union stayed out. And instead, what the Soviet Union did is they supplied and supported the other side. However, the Soviet Union occasionally got directly involved too, and America stayed out. So the war in Afghanistan uh, would see another civil conflict. And in this case, Soviet troops directly got involved in that conflict. And instead, America and NATO stayed out, but they supported the capitalist side in that conflict with money and resources. So the Cold War would last all the way up until the end of the 1980s, uh, when finally the Soviet Union would collapse for a variety of reasons. And uh, the Berlin Wall, which separated East Berlin from West Berlin, which you see in the picture here, would eventually come down, Germany be reunited, and the Cold War would end. And this brings us to the end of the course. I hope you've enjoyed this course. We've covered nearly 10,000 years of human history. Uh, we've gone all the way from when uh, human beings were hunter-gatherers, and we've seen Western civilization go through all of its twists and turns, and finally we almost uh, get up to uh, the present day, ending in 1990, which is practically yesterday from my point of view. So if you're interested in history courses, I hope you'll consider taking either some breadth or gen ed history courses in the future. And it's been my privilege to have uh, walked along on this journey through history with you.